drama over the release of Christopher Nolan's new thriller, Tenet, has been one of the biggest subplots in Hollywood's lost summer of 2020. Tenet has been delayed countless times, and whether or not it opens on a date that doubles as a palindrome, chances are it's going to emerge as the most industrially pivotal blockbuster in recent film history. The question of whether it's literally safe enough to take up the great contemporary American pastime of spending the air-conditioned months at the multiplex remains dangerously open. And really, it's only a filmmaker with Nolan's track record who could potentially tempt viewers back into movie theaters in large numbers. Between The Dark Knight, Inception, and Dunkirk, Nolan has found a way to consistently fuse spectacle with prestige staking a claim as perhaps the premier summer movie director of the 21st century. I'm Adam Naiman for The Ringer. In this video essay, we'll be taking a look at the historical evolution of the summer movie leading up to this moment, and also the history of the summer movie season, highlighting some key films and figures whose work brings us into our uncertain present tense and who will also endure beyond it. And that ain't all. The hippest American film distributor of the 1960s was Samuel Z. Arkoff's American International Pictures, which smartly capitalized on the growing youth market for movies spawned by the innovation of drive-ins and also the dawn of television, which was originally more oriented towards grown-ups and families. The movies, by contrast, were a place for teenagers to escape evenings at home and also to encounter seductive mirror images of themselves, whether via rebellious, leather-clad alter egos like Marlon Brando or James Dean, or wholesome yet sneakily sexy versions of high schoolers on summer vacation. The beach, Arkoff said, is a wonderful setting for a teenage movie, and it doesn't hurt to show girls in skimpy bathing suits. 1963's Beach Party imagined a world free of adults, and also of any problematic contemporary politics, focusing instead on the courtship rituals of young, attractive stars, like teen pop idol Frankie Avalon and Mickey Mouse Club member Annette Funicello. In the absence of a complex plot or substantial subtext, Beach Party offered sly satire in the form of a motorcycle gang model on the Rat Pack, as well as surf rock musical numbers and plenty of slapstick humor. The Fun in the Sun template established by Beach Party held strong for a number of sequels, variations, and ripoffs, including Beach Blanket Binko and How to Stuff a Wild Bikini, lightweight diversions that proved to have plenty of box office muscle without ever attaining critical admiration. Where later late 60s youth culture hits like The Graduate and Easy Rider were subversive, the Beach Party movies were instant kitsch. In 1973, a fledgling director named George Lucas offered his own variation on the genre with the nostalgia fest American Graffiti, set on the last night of summer vacation in 1962. Although the film doesn't feature any real beach imagery, it taps into the same feeling of adolescent utopia as the beach party movies, tinged instead with a sense of lost innocence that resonated in the uncertain paranoid atmosphere of the 1970s. I appreciate it. I'm just reacting to what I was told. Martin, it's all psychological. You yell Barracuda. Everybody says, huh? What? You yell Shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. The story of Jaws is that of the summer under attack. In the coastal tourist trap of Amity, the presence of a rogue great white shark endangers not only the lives of residents and visitors alike, but the fate of the local economy. While brilliantly designed as a thriller by its young director Steven Spielberg, Jaws is also a commentary on the carnivorous nature of big business, and Amity's delay in dealing with their shark problem comes with a high figurative price, including the death of a young woman who would have fit right into the Beach Party series. The film's indelible imagery of 4th of July appetizers obliviously lining up to be a hot lunch, in the words of Richard Dreyfuss's ichthyologist, tapped into an American fear of vulnerability that turned Jaws into an unprecedented hit, and also created a turning point in the history of summer movies. By opening immediately in nationwide wide release, rather than via slow word of mouth rollout, Jaws rerouted the industry standard for box office performance, inaugurating tradition in which first weekend grosses reigned supreme. 
Two summers later, George Lucas's exercise in a different kind of pop culture nostalgia than American Graffiti would shift paradigms one more time. But even though Star Wars is the bigger hit and the bigger global cinematic touchstone, Jaws' status as the ultimate summer movie about summer itself will never be equaled. if there's any change in his physical condition? Do you know that they use the most sophisticated training methods from the Soviet Union, East and West Germany, and the newest Olympic power, Trinidad Tobago? But it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. I tell you, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. You can blame Canada for Meatballs, a low-budget Ontario shot comedy that captured something popular and primal about the universal experience of summer camp. A few years before pioneering the special effects comedy genre with Ghostbusters, Canadian filmmaker Ivan Reitman displayed an uncanny underdog touch, aligning viewers with the cut-rate counselors and campers at the fictional Camp North Star shot at a real camp in the wilds of Ontario. While Meatball's structural and tonal model was obviously Animal House, the film had a more childlike perspective, with Bill Murray's sardonic counselor Tripper a less bludgeoning presence than John Belushi's Bluto. Where the collegiate pranksters in Animal House were often cruel, Meatballs cultivated a sweeter, more coming-of-age vibe. The film was an unexpected indie hit and energized a cycle of similarly Revenge of the Nerd-style teen comedies that served as counter-programming to the special effects behemoths dominating the Hollywood landscape. In 2001, cult comedian David Wayne wrote a love letter to Meatballs in the form of his masterpiece Wet Hot American Summer, an absurdist riff on Meatballs' plot and characters that wasn't just nostalgic for summer camp, but also the summer camp movies of the early 1980s. Where Meatballs imagines summer camp as a kind of lyrical secret paradise, Friday the 13th transforms it into an abattoir. The film takes the basic setup of Halloween and transfers it from the suburbs into the deep woods, with Camp Crystal Lake as the unlucky epicenter of a murderous rampage stemming from the accidental drowning the previous summer of a camper. In Meatballs, sex was aspirational, but in Friday the 13th it was a death sentence, weaponizing the myth of the wet-hot American summer in an even more sadistic fashion than Jaws. Brazen imitators like Sleepaway Camp borrowed Friday the 13th's format while upping the ante in terms of gore, while the film's own sequels would gradually move away from the summer camp backdrop in favor of the big city, as in Jason Takes Manhattan, or eventually Deep Space. Although the best gag in Jason X is a high-tech holographic recreation of Camp Crystal Lake that kids the predictability and iconography of the entire franchise. In Tim Burton's 1989 version of Batman, Gotham becomes a battleground in a one-way PR campaign. In addition to taking over the city's criminal empire, Jack Nicholson's Joker wants to wrest the headlines away from the caped crusader. That summer, Batman and his signature insignia were everywhere in the United States, to the point that the country was almost covered in merchandising material. The saturation advertising strategy inaugurated by Jaws was now being pushed to a post-Star Wars breaking point by Warner Brothers. It's amazing to think that only 30 years ago, an expensive comic book movie with giant stars was a bit of a risky box office bet. Batman's foregrounding of the Joker and of Nicholson, who reportedly made $50 million in the role, was an admission that they weren't sure that Batman himself could sell tickets. While there's nothing summery about Burton's grayed-out gothic aesthetic, Batman's hard-sell, stunt-heavy spectacle, which goes all the way over the top in a climax that was literally rewritten on set, represented an attempt to give audiences their money's worth in the last moment before CGI special effects would fully rewire their expectations for escapist entertainment. You killed my father. Big mistake. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. And Hamlet 
is taking out the trash. In the summer of 1993, Arnold Schwarzenegger was Hollywood's alpha movie star, which is why the producers of The Last Action Hero weren't worried about going head to head with Jurassic Park. In the face-off between the Terminator and a guy from The Fly, it didn't really seem like picking a winner on Judgment Day would be difficult. And in the end, it wasn't, because the real ruler of the summer movie season was Steven Spielberg, picking up where Jaws left off in the primal fear department, but with a few satirical millennial twists. Jurassic Park's story of a theme park that turns deadly doubled as a Frankenstein-style cautionary tale about scientific progress, as well as unchecked Hollywood greed. The scenes of the genetically engineered dinosaurs destroying their own expensive showcase from within was witty and prophetic, executed with aplomb by Spielberg. Meanwhile, the last action hero's heavy-handed attempt to ironize Schwarzenegger's persona failed, partly due to a muddled script and partly because its analog special effects couldn't compete with the speed, fluidity, and realism of what Spielberg and his team were conjuring up over in the next theater in the multiplex. Schwarzenegger's star would never rise so high again, and Jurassic Park won not only the box office battle, but also the war outgrossing the last action hero exponentially and paving the way for other Spielbergian exercises in photorealistic CGI fantasy. Who's the man? Wait till I get another plane! I'm lining all your friends up right beside you! Where you at, huh? Huh? Where you at? Ah! Welcome to Earth. Even in a pre-9-11 zeitgeist, the money shot of Roland Emmerich's Independence Day generated controversy. Not since the Statue of Liberty had been demolished at the end of Planet of the Apes had a mainstream movie fused patriotic and apocalyptic iconography like the vaporization of the White House by alien invaders. Released in the same summer as Tim Burton's 50s throwback Mars Attacks, ID4 was by far the dumber of the two movies. But where Burton tried for a disaster movie style ensemble cast, Emmerich wisely paired nerd chic icon Jeff Goldblum with the most charismatic up and coming star around, Will Smith, whose charm, handsomeness, and wide demographic appeal were just waiting for the right star vehicle to send him into the stratosphere. One year after defending the honor of the 4th of July on screen, Smith owned the Independence Day weekend as the star of Men in Black, an even sleeker extraterrestrial buddy comedy that came fully packaged with a hit rap single. Smith's summer movie Winning Streak became a kind of running Hollywood myth, one broken in 1999 by Wild Wild West, which retained all the elements of his hits, including a buddy formula pairing him with Kevin Klein, but didn't stick the landing as a piece of filmmaking downgrading from a sure bet into a box office misfire. I want to tell you my secret now. Okay. I see. 1999 has gone down in history as a landmark year for American movies, but it's also an outlier in terms of summer blockbusters. The year's biggest hit came early in the form of The Matrix, while the commercial failure of Wild Wild West and a few other highly touted all-ages titles like The Iron Giant and Inspector Gadget opened the field up to unexpected contenders, including a pair of horror movies that ended up among the year's most profitable pound-for-pound -pound hits. Released on July 30th, several months after its buzzy premiere at Sundance, The Blair Witch Project reversed expectations by offering no escapist imagery at all. Instead, the film closes like a trap around its protagonists, whose expedition into the Black Hills in search of a local legend is revealed to be a fatal mistake. With no stars, no brand name director, and no special effects, The Blair Witch Project felt unprecedented in the context of the summer movie season, and ended up making more than $250 million worldwide, an even better ratio of budget to gross than the 80s slasher movies it evoked without copying. Then in August, another, differently old-school thriller would become a similar word-of-mouth hit. Enlisting Bruce Willis in a subtler role in his asteroid-smashing roughneck in Armageddon, M. Night Shyamalan's The Sixth Sense impressed critics and blew the minds of seen-it-all viewers. 
If the filmmaker was compared by critics to Spielberg, it was because of his directorial powers of manipulation, which held the film's big twist in plain sight for its entire duration. No less than The Matrix or David Fincher's Fight Club, The Sixth Sense was a millennial head trip, and turned Shyamalan into a summer movie tentpole director in the early 2000s, with Unbreakable, Signs, and The Village, all of which were successful, even as they arguably provided diminishing artistic returns. No additional shots nor powder. A compass that doesn't point north. And I half expected it to be made of wood. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. But you have heard of me. The long-standing complaint that Hollywood blockbusters begun to resemble theme park rides was made fun of by Jurassic Park and then fully embodied a decade later by Pirates of the Caribbean, which transformed Disneyland's most famous attraction into a nostalgic swashbuckler. What made the film work beyond its engineering as a piece of intellectual property was the casting of Johnny Depp as the flamboyant, anti-heroic Jack Sparrow. His eccentricity built on the weirdo heroism of Nick Cage's 90s action hits with even more audacious stylization. Gore Verbinski's Spielbergian direction emphasized Depp's unpredictability in terms of physical gestures and line readings, even as the film around him hit a series of sturdy, old-school adventure movie beats, indebted to 30s icons like Errol Flynn and Douglas Fairbanks. While obviously working in a different and more earthbound genre, the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise stands as the new millennium's closest equivalent to Star Wars, expanding its mythology and set of recurring characters over a series of increasingly popular sequels to become one of the highest grossing film series of all time. All this shit. Look at my shit. I got, I got shorts, every fucking color. Mm -hmm. I got designer t-shirts <laughs> I got gold bullets motherfucking vampires mm -hmm. I got Scarface mm -hmm. on repeat best movie Scarface on repeat constant y'all I got escape Calvin escape. Klein escape Although it technically came out in March of 2013 Harmony Corinne's Spring Breakers is the key millennial summer movie a 21st century beach party with Selena Gomez stepping in for Annette Funicello as a sort of Disney Channel girl gone wild. The thin line dividing trash and art is obliterated by Corinne's playful aesthetics, which filter reality television overload and cliches through art house style, including obsessive repetition, surreal sound design, and deliberately provocative sexual and racial politics, the latter exemplified by James Franco's turn as a white gangster wannabe named Alien. It's hard to know what to take seriously in Spring Breakers, and the answer may be not much. Like Corinne's later stoner comedy The Beach Bum, it's basically a sunburn monument to excessive bad taste. It's also the movie that, more than any other, helped to put the new distributor of A24 on the map, turning them into a contender and consolidating a major cult audience in the process. Look at all my shit Franco boasts, a trashy Gatsby high on his own supply, and the perfect mantra for a movie that insists on showing off even when it doesn't necessarily have anything to say. In the summer of 2020, no two cinematic brands loom larger than Marvel and Pixar, whose mutually smooth assembly line approach to movie making has guaranteed their output a mainstream appeal that skeptics might argue is antithetical to the extremity or personality necessary in order to make art rather than entertainment. Predictability and quality control are part of both Marvel and Pixar's package, and while neither studio is necessarily a summer movie specialist, they've still recently ruled that section of the calendar. The first two Avengers movies were released during peak box office season, while Endgame and Infinity War each kicked off their respective summers before Memorial Day. Pixar's first big summer hit was the ocean-themed Finding Nemo, which nodded to Jaws by including a great white named Bruce, even as it riffed on the more melancholy, emotional pull of E.T. A more recent summer release like The Incredibles 2 plays as a send-up of a superhero-saturated marketplace. It's sort of Pixar's Marvel movie. 
If you believe the idea that summer movies are meant to unify a mass audience, Pixar and Marvel's market dominance means mission accomplished. For those nostalgic for a sense of rebellion, their omnipresent family-friendly success may feel a bit like a trap. We hope that you've enjoyed this video essay, and we'll know soon enough whether Tenet ends up writing its own chapter in this history, or ends up as a casualty of this lost summer. Sound off in the comments with any movies that you think that we may have missed, and stay safe and cool wherever you are.